Okay, thanks, thanks so much, guys, for coming um, uh, to this session. Uh, my name is Sayandeep. I am a senior researcher in IBM Research Labs India. And uh, the talk today is going to be about EB, PF, DevSecOps, and tools for it, right? Caveat at the beginning, the work that we are going to talk about is a bit researchy, right? So it's something where I think I'm, we are going to talk a bit more about the vision and try to make a case about why such tooling is necessary, right? And why these are exciting, at least to us, and hopefully we can convince some of you to come work with us and collaborate and build a community around this space, right? So the work I'm going to present today is something that we have been working in IBM Research with uh, mostly faculty partners at this point uh, from different universities. I'm not going to uh, read through the logos. Um, right? All the work that we are doing is in open source. And as part of the work, we are essentially uh, learning more about eBPF and uh, uh, as part of our day jobs, what we have realized is, uh, so we use eBPF in IBM Research for doing certain work, uh, mostly in the space of um, uh, improving the performance of network data path, observability, monitoring, and all the other cool stuff I guess you will be hearing a, a lot of uh, through the day, right? And while doing that, we realized that we do need these kind of developer tools to make it easier for people to uh, really uh, embrace eBPF and uh, benefit from it. What's eBPF, right? So by the way, this talk, even though it's researchy, uh, I'm going to try and keep it at a very high level, right? I'm most probably okay with not finishing all my slides as well. I'll go slow. Uh, so, you yeah. uh, know, right. So, EBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filters, right? So TLDR, it's a mechanism for you to write code. You know, not really JavaScript, but you know, regular application programming code, and run it natively inside the Linux kernel, right? So you have your EBPF code, which here right now is written in C in the snippet. You don't have to read it. You'll have a compiler. It will compile it into a bunch of byte code, and then kernel will run it as if it was its own native code, right? So that's awesome, hopefully, for all of us, uh, because you know system coding is hard, kernel coding is really, really hard, and uh, eBPF kind of allows people to go there and write their own custom code and really uh, customize kernel. Now. Here comes the caveat, right? It can't be really all type of code or any type of code. And the code you will write will run inside a sandboxed virtual machine, right? So essentially, uh, you would have a virtual machine running this bytecode inside the kernel. And uh, eBPF will have its own data structures, which will allow it to save data, exchange data with uh, users' applications and other eBPF applications. And it will have a bunch of helpers to really go and introspect into the kernel, like what really is happening, right? Uh, so, so that's essentially what eBPF is as a technology. And the good part or the excitement about it is because it's safe, right? It's safe because it runs inside a VM. And if you look at it, there's a verifier in front, right? So once the code is compiled and you get a bunch of verifier code, you, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, object code, the verifier will actually check, right? Run checks on it uh, and ensure that this code cannot crash the kernel, right? If it finds something which is not up to the mark, which is problematic, it's just going to reject and not load your code. It's efficient, right? It's efficient because you only generate small amount of bytecode that can do the stuff that you want to, your kernel to do, right? And it's also um, efficient because it, the alternatives still now were go change kernel code, right? Uh, you know, try to push it upstream, take a few years, wait for it to get into a distro, right? And that's when your kernel is modified. Or write your own Linux kernel module right? Load it up, 
but you maintain it over its lifetime, right? All of that is gone with eBPF. Um, and again, the other good feature is it's load at runtime, so you really don't need to reboot or something, right? As, as soon as the verifier accepts your code, it's inserted and kernel just treats it as its native code, right? So this is awesome. A lot of applications have proliferated around it. I think the speaker before me talked about New Relic, Pixie, right? This is the secret sauce that makes Pixie work. One of the secret sauce, let me put it that way, right? This is the part, so, so, so what eBPF has been used for is for, it's used for security and monitoring, right? Let's say you have certain uh, system that's deployed in cloud and you have certain uh, workloads running on it, right? You can essentially, uh, there are tools out there like Falco, Tetragon, Pixie, and so on and so forth, which will allow you to actually introspect what exactly is the data that those applications that are running in your uh, workload doing, right? And then essentially run advanced analytics on top and, you know, take decisions on whether that should be allowed, disallowed, and so on and so forth at runtime. Awesome stuff. It allows us to do observability and monitoring, right? Kind of buzzwords in our Kubernetes and cloud native world. I'm not going to go into the depth of it, but pretty much anything and everything you can think of who sent this packet, starting from who sent this packet, to like uh, things like who opened the file, uh, where and all was, what did the code, by application binary, make copies of the packet, so on and so forth. Like a lot of things you can figure out using observability and monitoring, right? And networking, right? It's, it's heavily used in networking. So if you are aware of, uh, I guess, there are going to be sessions today on uh, Cilium, for example, I saw, right? So Cilium's networking is essentially done in eBPF, and it's deployed, uh, in, it's deployed or it's available as a CNI plugin for all the hyperscaler offerings of uh, managed Kubernetes services, right? So, and you can do excellent stuff like you can bypass layers of code that you don't need in kernel and get orders of magnitude performance improvement, all using eBPF, right? And Super awesome part, lots of this code is anyway in open source for, so it's really uh, uh, a lot of startups have mushroomed uh, on top of this, which are innovating with this eBPF code to build their applications, you know, right? And hyperscalers are adopting it, right? Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Netflix, all of them are part of this eBPF foundation, right? If you, uh, for example, any packet or any connection that we open to Meta, Facebook, that, has, that gets processed by some eBPF code, right? On, uh, on an average, at any given point of time in 2019, there are uh, 15 eBPF programs which are running in any Facebook server, right? Uh, okay, sorry, it's 40 for Facebook and 15 for uh, Netflix, right? I think these numbers have gone up. I don't know how, what they are, but they have definitely gone up. So it's super exciting uh, technology. It's going to allow us to have a custom kernel, Linux kernel. If you don't want to run something on application layer, you want kernel to take a Linux system to take care of it. eBPF is a potential uh, source to do that. All good stuff. And it's, it's essentially C code, right? So you, we, you, we can write it as application developers. So what's hard? Right? What's stopping us from just still writing JavaScript applications and not writing everything right in the kernel? Right? So it's, it's, it turns out it's hard right, to write eBPF code uh, to keep the system safe, right? because the, essentially what you're allowing is for the user to write a piece of code, and you are going to run it inside the kernel. Uh, there are certain constraints that are placed on the code. You have only bounded loops. Right? So you can only iterate in a loop for a certain amount of time. Your program size needs to be restricted, otherwise the verifier really cannot figure things out. There are exponential number of possibilities if your program size is bigger than a certain number. Right? Limited scratch memory, lack of floating point support, all of it, most of it is done with the idea of keeping the kernel safe. Right? And then kernel verifier has its own idiosyncrasies. Right? So it will ensure, uh, it will check whether a variable has been declared and whether memory space has been assigned multiple times. So anytime you access something, 
you have to kind of check for whether that space is actually that memory is actually safe to access and so on, right? So, so it has its in idiosyncrasies, which makes it very hard, kind of hard for new people to write the code they want, right? Um, you know, your own observability snippet, let's say, right? Uh, just for that special flow that you have, right in the kernel, so that you don't have to maintain a big piece of application for it, right? So, so it makes it hard. So why not reuse code, right? Actually, a lot of production-grade code, for example, Facebook's load balancer entirely written in eBPF, Cilium, bunch of Pixie, Falco, and other code is available online, Tracy, right? I think we are going to have some talks on those later in the day. Uh, so all of that is available in open source. A lot of it is available in open source. So why not reuse? Just take what you know, makes sense for us. But turns out that is very hard, right, for a lot of the code that's out there, right? So there are essentially two kinds of code bases in eVPF space, broadly speaking. You have observability code, which is essentially one shot, I just want to observe certain value, right? How many files are getting opened, how many TCP connections are getting opened kind of stuff. Those are small pieces of code. Rest of it is very complex. A load balancer that Facebook has, right? It's not just a load, a load balancer written in eBPF. It has its own, uh, it's a big, large monolith, which has code, let's say, to uh, decapsulate the tunneling of the packet, right? So before a packet comes in and you can load balance it, Facebook's infrastructure has its own virtualization of tunneling that needs to be removed out. It has its own code to do uh, observability, built in, right? All those code, is kind of intermixed with functionalities like filtering uh, and uh, um, bridging and so what have you, along with the load balancer, right? So it becomes very hard to pick what you want, right? Uh, and again, it's uh, customized for their infrastructure, the, open, the person who open sourced it. So you need to kind of take care of it and make it work for your own good, right? So that essentially is one of the first problems that we have started addressing, uh, there's no easy way to understand, find, and extract relevant code, right? And really play with it and make super awesome applications using eBPF. Right? So this is the background. Uh, eBPF in itself is exploding. There is a lot of work. The technology is evolving and other things. A lot of support. I'm not going to talk about it now, right? It's a bigger session, but, you know. Uh, eBPF.io is a good place to start if you want to know more. Right? I'm going to talk a bit about next uh, understanding the eBPF code. Right? What can we do? How can we understand? And then once we have understood what this code does, how can we extract out what is useful for us? Right? And then I'm just briefly going to mention, like if we understood code, how could we make it better for the other downstream applications, like ops? How do you debug these code pieces? How do you ensure that a code that you have inserted into the kernel is not exfiltrating out all your data. Observability is supposed to do that. Monitoring is supposed to do that. How do you, and they're not doing that. I'm not saying that they are doing it. But how do you as a business trust that, right? So all those applications are downstream. I'm not going to talk about them, but just give a teaser. So what we want to build is a eBPF program registry, right? So given an eBPF source code, we want to kind of explain what exactly this code is doing, right? And we want to explain it so that the user, the third-party user, finds it easy to understand, right? Uh, that what is the functionality that's present in this code. We are building some automated inferencing of code functionality, right? Like, given a piece of code, can I tell you this is tunneling code? Can I tell you this is uh, observability code? And so on and so forth, right? And then we have we've tried to put up a GUI with Elasticsearch to kind of run advanced queries on top of this uh, explainability data that we are extracting. Right? So this is what the explainability data kind of looks like. Don't read it. The first part of it is essentially consists of human annotations, right? So as part of our work, we work closely with a bunch of universities, and we are training man like uh, students there in eBPF. And what we have realized, which is a win-win for us, is to learn eBPF, it becomes, it's, it's really helpful if they start writing comments for the code. 
which we obviously will check and ensure that it's correct and so on and so forth. So we are creating a, a database of that and it's all in open source. We are using uh, AI summarization algorithms, right? The large language models, AI for code. I don't even want to talk about the algorithms there. We all know, we have all played with those, right? So we are using those, we are running those, right? We are using domain expertise to figure out what exactly are the various capabilities this code uses, right? Like, is this code something that can read an internal data structure and so on, right? Turns out it is easy enough to automate by looking at the source code. And then we have started going into like programming language techniques like control flow analysis, data flow analysis, right? They're ready-made tools to understand how the data is flowing through a source code. Again, there is a lot of, uh, all of it is an open source and there are research partners here, so, uh, and we welcome participation, right? So these are the kind of informations we are taking out and essentially storing it in a database on top of which we have run uh, Elasticsearch and we present uh, a Kibana dashboard to kind of browse it, right? Now in Kibana, what we are, or in case of Elasticsearch, what we are also trying to experiment with is semantic understanding of functions, right? So let's say, uh, what does that mean, right? I mean, a lot of text, a lot of documentation or a lot of English text can mean the same thing semantically, but it's just written in a different way, right? So uh, for example, a query which asks for all functions which parse IPv4 headers, right? can actually include packet, uh, functions which process L3 headers, right? And which also process uh, encapsulated IP headers, and so on and so forth, right? So this is what the inbuilt uh, elastic search capability gives us now. And we are essentially extending it with state-of-art um, uh, LLM algorithms, right, to search better, okay? So this is where uh, the annotated code that we have created is available. Uh, the GUI and Elasticsearch is right now in a PR for some time. It's going to get merged soon, so it's all available in case people want to experiment with it and generally, you know, chat with the faculty partners and us. Um, so now, yes, awesome. I have some understanding of code. I have used Elasticsearch to find it, right? Now, I want to take it out. I want to take out a piece of code which is really about, let's say, parsing IPv4 packets. If the packets are wrong, dropping it, right? That's all I care about in my infrastructure. Uh, turns out, as I was talking, telling before, that code is in a monolith and enmeshed with a lot of other code, right? There is going to be some code which is going, before it uh, parses the IPv4 header, it's going to remove the tunneling header. It's going to do a size check. It's going to do a rate limiting check. All the things that you need in an infrastructure like uh, to run properly, it's embedded in that code, right? So we need to remove that, right? So for that, we kind of built a tool uh, for extraction of functionalities, right? Which, if you can point us to a function, let's say derived from the Elasticsearch GUI that we have uh, for uh, project repository, right? If you point that to us, we will find all its dependencies, which means all the potential functions it can call, and recursively the other functions those, that those colleagues will call, all the data structures that your function can potentially access, right? Find all these dependencies, and we are going to then take this code out and uh, uh, give it to you in a separate file, right? while ensuring that we minimize technical, debt, uh, technical debt, right? So one way to take all the code, or rather take the functionality you have, is just identify the starting point, take the entire binary, right? And just call that from main. That works functionally, but then you are maintaining a big body of code. You don't want to do that, right? And we ensure that this passes the verifier check, provided the initial code that you wanted to extract from, pass it past the eBPA verifier. So for this, we have, again, we don't need to go into the details. We have used tools called uh, Code Query, uh, which recursively allows us to identify all the functions that you will end up calling uh, uh, for a given function, right? We use a TXL, uh, which we use TXL, which is a source language transform source transformation tool to kind of help us find out the function start and endpoints and so on and so forth. And all of it is available as a, uh, 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 
Python script, right? So given a function that we are interested in, we are going to uh, create that uh, file extracted.c at the end of it, along with all the functions that it needs. Uh, we will also do certain things. These are trivial details. We don't need to go into it, but you know, this uh, you need to ensure ordering between different functions. You need to ensure that all of it is GPL licensed code. Most of it is GPL licensed code. The licensing is correctly copied over. Uh, if you're copying code from different files, turns out that there is redefinition of function names, right? Uh, so we need to add appropriate preprocessor guards to ensure that the code uh, compiles properly and so on. So all of it is done. And then we, right now we have a manual process to generate a make file as well, right? So this was a talk actually in Linux Plumbers conference last year, right? Uh, we have a demo also for this. Uh, the code for this tool is again available. It's, uh, we are very enthusiastic if, in case there are eBPF uh, practitioners or you know, people who want to write eBPF code uh, to come talk to me. I was going to say us. My, uh, anyway, talk, talk to me and we can discuss, right? So, so that's ongoing work. And now finally, um, taking it to how, where else will this be useful, right? Uh, so the place where we see this to be useful is uh, in ops and scale, right? So we talked about how do you get people to write new code, right? Once the code is written by multiple people, right? Uh, all the vendors who are writing EVF for security, observability, uh, networking, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, as and when we as maintainers, the SREs, run this code on our platform, what are the tools that are available to help me figure out that this module is faulty, right? If, if you guys are familiar with the IP table side of things in networking, at least you can see a rule which says, here is a rule which drops the packet. In case of eBPF, you got a bytecode, 01000. I don't know what it does. I know it won't crash the computer. I don't know if it is actually dropping a packet. Right? We don't know those things. But as SREs, you are far away from the developer and the company who sold it off to you, and you have to fix it, let's say. Right? So essentially, the explainability module, right now, even though we are focusing on development, is something that's useful for debugging. Right? Let's say you have a bunch of IP table rules inside your K8S uh, uh, data plane, along with newfangled eBPF code, let's say from Cilium or some other CNI of your choice with some monitoring code from Datadog, New Relic, and other places, right? And maybe something goes wrong. New Relic is most probably, OK, I shouldn't name names, but uh, let's say there will be a, a separation of responsibilities. And you have to, as a maintainer, maintain across all of these different modules, right? You have to worry about whether Cilium plus New Relic or something else is causing the problem, right? So that's where you would like to have tools, or we think we would like to have tools which can answer queries like following. Tell me if there is an eBPF code, let's say, which drops packet if the packet type is SCTP, or if there is a protocol uh, or a module which will encapsulate the packet, right? Or is there a module which copies the packet, redirects the connection, something like that, right? So those are essentially the next set of tools that we have started actively working on. Uh, we, I can discuss those offline if there is interest, right? And similarly, the same capabilities can be used for audit and SecOps purposes, right? You are not supposed to, let's say, clone or and exfiltrate data. You, you are not generally, right? How do you know? How do you know that the binary doesn't do that? Those tools. So takeaways, eBPF is something that's evolving. It's already inside Linux kernel the base layer, the mothership, the core, whatever, on top of which our entire industry is built, it's there, right? It has big support. The big supporting people are the hyperscalers and other big companies who are building tools. And there are a lot of startups which are doing excellent work to really customize the system for you, right? It's, it's here to stay. Uh, people who will use the software don't have tools, right? Especially if they're taking tools from multiple vendors, they don't really have tools to live or to kind of you know, make their lives easy, do their job. Uh, that's our conjecture. It's a bold statement, I guess. But I'm happy to hear otherwise. Right? 
So come, join us. Let's build certain tools. Uh, quick note, uh, we, for people who are convinced and who are already using eBPF, we want to learn more, right? We want to learn what tools do you think you need in your uh, to, 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 you know, in your job role if you are working with eBPF. Uh, so there's a link to a survey. Uh, please take a picture uh, if this is interesting uh, to you. And here is a GitHub repo. Uh, come join us. Uh, uh, while training students in this new age technology, what we have realized is um, uh, Annotating and commenting code is the best way to learn, so we can do, you can help us do that, right? If you have functions that you want to really extract out and leave all the um, other functions out in your eBPF code, use our tools. Uh, if you have favorite modules that you want us to extract, come talk to us, right? And if also, uh, this is a request, if there is any uh, thought or any um, interest in having an enthusiast group around eBPF, uh, we would be very happy, happy to participate in that as well. So with that, I am done. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. How can you supersede the existing uh, kernel? Like whatever you are doing in a, a sandbox, right? How can you supersede the existing uh, kernel? Right. So I'll give you an example, right? Let's say you want to monitor any time uh, a file gets opened, right? So what kernel allow, gives you by default is a bunch of hook points, right? Places where you can go and attach a piece of code, and it will execute it for you, okay. right? So once your code is verified, and it has been loaded, and again, sandbox is a loaded thing. Uh, it is supposed to be sandbox, but for performance reasons, what happens is once you run it inside the sandbox in verify, realize that this code is good. It won't crash the kernel. It won't crash the kernel it will just generate the machine code and run it. But for us, it's essentially sandbox kind of uh, security with performance of native code. OK. One more. Uh, can I uh, perform the eBPF in the, all the managed uh, Kubernetes also? Like, uh, apart from self-managed, can I uh, utilize this eBPF? Yeah. In? Okay. I mean, uh, if you, let's say, in your self-managed cluster, you are using, let's say, Cilium as your CNI, that has eBPF anyway. Right? If you are using BPF, Trace, BCC, or tools like Datadog, SysDig, they are using eBPF to kind of give you the information you're interested in. OK, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, great initiative, by the way. You know, thank it, you. It, it's great to see eBPF gaining such kind of momentum. We ourselves make use of eBPF for uh, you know, both observability and security purpose. Awesome. is the project. Uh, one question, you know, there's, there's a similar initiative from L3AF.io. Yes. Right. So, how is this different from that? Like, uh, or are you? Uh, uh, I'll give. You, we have been in talks with them. I see. Right. Uh, what they do is they uh, the, the the synergy we see is in marketplaces. Right. Okay. So, they, uh, Leaf L three A F Leaf. Uh, there are other companies like Solo.io and a mm. few others. They have their own marketplaces. Right. What we want to do is instead of having monoliths hosted there. We want to create a bunch of modules, NF modules, and host them using, you know, which, which we build essentially using our tools. I couldn't go into that part. So, okay. And essentially, they would host. How do, you, how do you handle the performance implications of chaining this eBPF bytecode? That, that there's a performance cost towards uh, handling that. I've yes, there is. There is. No, no, I understand. Yes, absolutely. We should talk more. Okay. Uh, so, the, I, 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 so we have a, and this is going to research territory. So what we do is essentially we have, so I talked about extract as the developer tool, right? We have other tools called transform, which is essentially XDP code, but I really want it on TC. Can you transform? We have tools called merge, which here is a piece of code, here is another piece of code. I am going to merge it together, right? And then we have split also. This is too big. Split and give me only certain functionalities. These are research tools, but I'm very happy to talk about those because this is an initiative where we are working with, I think this is mostly done out of CMU and uh, um, uh, University of Milan right now with us, and we are more than happy to have uh, people who actually would want to look at it. But yes, great question, merge split exist. 30 minutes I had to 
you know, pedal EVPF and tool and so it didn't fit.